I've come to believe that the recipe for achieving outstanding results in any area is very simple. One, determine the outcome that you want. Now that can be hard, you have to know what you want. But if you do, determine the outcome that you want. Two, define the ongoing process that would lead to that outcome. And then three, fall in love with the process. To illustrate this point, I'd like to share with you some of my personal story as someone who has learned this lesson over and over and over and forgotten it and relearned it and forgotten it and relearned it uh, throughout my journey of aspiring to be a musical artist. This is the first part of a multi-part series called Fall in Love with the Process, Not the Outcome. When I was a kid in the 90s, I wanted to be a rock star. Surprise, surprise. I wanted all that attention and success that I saw the alternative rock superstars getting when I watched MTV. Reflecting on it today, it's a little troubling that the epidemic of artists in the limelight being miserable and overdosing on drugs or committing suicide uh, didn't really sway my conviction one bit, as if those tragic endings didn't have anything to do with their fame. I didn't bother to think about what success meant to me on a personal level, and I definitely didn't bother to think about what it might take to get to that achievement of stardom that I thought that I wanted. I just saw something someone else had, and I wanted that end result. All I knew was that music moved me deeply, and that some people were making a lot of money and getting a lot of attention for looking super cool while they sang songs and played guitar. So off I went on my journey with no strategy other than just hoping that if I looked cool and if I sang songs and if I played guitar, that then one day I would get discovered. I would, it would just suddenly happen. I had no sense of the idea of slowly and methodically working towards something that could be profoundly rewarding on a personal level. I thought overnight success was all success was. So first things first, I put on my oversized Seattle 90s flannel, put on my ripped up corduroys, and then second agenda item, I started a band. And then after those important things were out of the way, I started working on writing songs. And I really poured my heart and soul into writing songs. I intuitively knew that what was moving me deeply from the music that I listened to was coming from something that was raw and, and vulnerable and honest. So I gave songwriting every ounce of emotional energy that I had. And soon after that, regardless of the fact that my guitar was out of tune and I didn't know how to tune it and I couldn't sing on pitch, I really couldn't, something happened that was unexpected. Something happened that I didn't even know existed. And that was that I fell in love with the process. So I didn't really know what was happening to me at the time. I can reflect on it now and see this, but after that, it was all about the process and increasingly so. I was still susceptible to any criticism or praise as much as anyone else. And I still enjoyed the recognition or attention from performing and getting performing opportunities. But the real hunt that I was on was chasing that feeling that I would get from writing songs and playing them regardless of if anyone heard them or not. So I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And the band that I was in, we worked on refining these songs and we rehearsed them over and over again, trying to get them polished, trying to just get them feeling however felt good to us. We had no sense of work ethic. We didn't have any, we weren't thinking of any big picture outcome at this point. We were just doing whatever felt good to us and just doing it because it was fun. We would play for friends and family, mostly privately, sometimes at parties or something like that. But uh, for the most part, we didn't think about really what the point of what we were doing was outside of just uh, being creative and doing it for ourselves. And we just did that for years. Eventually, we stopped sounding like kids in a band and our friends would say, oh, you sound like a real band now, <laughs> which was like a huge compliment to us. And this led to getting some performance opportunities and playing in public and starting to get noticed from people that we didn't actually know, which was also like a crazy idea. What? This person is not our friend or one of our family members and they care at all or know, know who we are. And so this just led to more opportunities. And at one point we had the head of a 
big name record label come over to our basement rehearsal space uh, to watch one of our rehearsals. We didn't get signed onto the label from that meeting. We never got signed, but we got introduced to, because of that, to a renowned record producer and ended up recording multiple times in these amazing studios with this producer who had worked with artists that we were starstruck by and kind of started us early on in this journey, the people that we were seeing on MTV and stuff like that. So without even trying, I was kind of encroaching onto the edges of this initial dream that I had. From those recordings, we got some attention from the press. We got some radio play. We played live on the radio. We got booked at one of Seattle's major music festivals. And uh, that was that was our peak. That was that was it at that time. And we were still in high school, so these things seemed huge to us. These, of course, are considered desirable accomplishments, especially for high school kids. But I woke up every morning and I went to sleep every night, not thinking about those outcomes and those accomplishments or or getting the attention, but just how much I was in love with the process, how obsessed I was with wanting to write that next song and get it sounding polished and just feel that feeling from it and then rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat, which is the only reason we got to those places anyway. So this part of the story doesn't end with stardom like my much younger self envisioned. And as for the band, we just split up around that time because we graduated high school and went off to various colleges. But this little chapter alone looked at from the perspective of reaching for end results and and setting goals could be seen as uh, an example of shooting for the stars and landing on the moon. I definitely experienced some solid wins and had some amazing adventures during that phase of my life. But the most valuable part of this, and the only part that I can take with me into the future anyway, is the lesson that I accidentally learned. And that's that exciting results happen from falling in love with the process, not the outcome. Seriously, exciting results happen from falling in love with the process, not the outcome. Of course, my overall story does not end there. I actually had to learn this lesson several more times before it really started to sink in. I had to forget it and relearn it a couple times. I had to encounter some real challenges and failures before it really started to sink in, before I really started to have full faith and confidence in this approach and this idea, and before I got to the point where now I believe in it so much that I want to share it with you in a multi-part series. So stay tuned for the next installment, Falling in Love with the Process, Not the Outcome, Part 2. And I'll continue the story and share how I got closer to learning how to intentionally and strategically implement this as a practice, how I'm using it today in my life, and how anyone can use it to accomplish practically anything they want. This is the first part of a multi-part series called Fall in Love with the Outcome, Not the Process. Whoops, said that backwards. (laughs) Opposite lesson.